All right, let's get started. I'm going to talk about repairing arcade hardware in theory and in practice. Uh, practice is the hard part. So let's say you picked up this sweet broken game for next to nothing, and uh, you get it home and you figure out, oh crap, it doesn't work. <laughs> so where do you start if you want to take this game and fix it? So what we're going to discuss is a general troubleshooting technique called bisection. So this works on any problem, and we're going to see how it applies specifically to coin-op arcade games. So here's a block diagram of a typical uh, coin-op machine. So you see there's AC power, DC power supply, PCB, monitor, speaker, controls. Just about any game is going to have uh, a system kind of like this. This is a diagram out of the Tempest manual that shows specifically how the the different components in the Tempest and how all of the signals connect from one to the other. So when you have a broken machine, you don't really know what your problem is. It could be any one or more than one of these things. And what you want to do is start breaking that system down and using the process of obs observation and substitution in order to isolate where the problem is. So this can mean putting parts that you know are good into your unknown system. So you might have an extra PCB, so you can put that in your system and see what happens to my problem. Does it go away? Is it still there? Or if you have a working system, you can put your unknown part into your working system and see what happens now. So what you want to do is swap these parts around and see where does the symptom go? Does it go with the part that I moved? or does it stay with the part of the system that I left alone? And that'll help you isolate the specific component that has the issue. So let's say you have a graphics issue. This could be any one of a number of things in your system. It could be your PCB is producing bad video output. It could be your monitor not displaying the output that your PCB is producing. It could be your power supply is not giving clean power to your PCB so it's not operating correctly could be the wiring. Maybe you have a broken wire, bad connector, all of this stuff that you know, might uh, go wrong in your system. So how would you attack this problem? So you could say, put in a no good video signal, right? That means that you're isolating your monitor from the rest of the system and you can see, does the monitor display what I'm expecting it to display? Or is my problem still there? You can use a portable test pattern generator you can put in a known working PCB. You can connect up your monitor to a game that you know works. All of these are taking your problem and rearranging the parts so you can see where does the symptom follow, therefore which component is uh, faulty. And you just always want to make sure when you change the system, does the problem follow? So what if you don't have all that junk? What if you don't have a test pattern generator, extra monitor, extra PCB, basement full of games, make friends. You know, there's someone out there who has all this stuff. Um, you can make friends online, you can make friends in person, and getting that guidance and that support for tools, uh, that's going to be really extremely helpful. So let's look at another issue. And by the way, I just did these slides today, so I have no idea if this is going to fill an hour. We might just fill this up with Q&A. So what if you turn your game on and it's completely dead? So you, any system has a hierarchy of needs, right? At the bottom you have power. We don't have power and nothing is going to work. On top of that you have logic. And at the very top you have your I.O. So your display, your speaker, your controls, that kind of stuff. So when you're trying to isolate a system where you get nothing at all, you want to start at the bottom of that and make sure your power is good. So come up with a theory. Let's say you know, we're flipping the switch and absolutely nothing changes. So what's our theory? There's no AC coming into the gate, no AC power. So check the power supply input. You should be getting 115 volts. Is that there? If not, where do you go? Trace back towards the source. So you're going to have a line filter. You're going to have a fuse. You want to be checking all of those things to say, here's this point in the system where I'm making an observation. And I see that based on that, the problem is upwards from there or downwards, you know, to, towards the source, and it's not towards the destination. Um, 
fuses all the time. When you check a fuse, always pull at least one half of it out of circuit. If you test it in circuit, you're going to get a bad reading. So you'll miss really easy problems just making simple mistakes like that. And power switches. You know, you'd be surprised how often a power switch will fail. Just a simple device like that, and your whole game will be dead. Interlock switches. Most games have uh, additional switches that are mounted on the back of the cabinet or on the coin door. So if you open it up to service it, it shuts off the AC power so you don't electrocute yourself. Well, you know, if things go bad, you're also not going to be getting power to your game. And you also might just have a bad line cord. Wiring breaks a lot more than you would expect. So let's say you have AC power. Well, let's say you have a new theory. You have AC power. Maybe your DC power out of your power supply is dead and your monitor is dead. That can happen. So what would you do? Hook up test pattern generator to your monitor. See, is your monitor working? Uh, check the test points on your PCB. See, are you getting power there? Check your power supply outputs. See if you're getting power there. Unhook your PCB. A lot of times you'll have a short on the PCB, you'll get no reading on your power supply, unplug it, you have the voltage there. So now we're going to get into some more technical stuff and uh, feel free to interrupt with questions because uh, I guess I need to kill time. Uh, if you have any questions on any of this, please uh, just let me know. Yes? Uh, uh, so is there an order, if you get a new system and you're told that it's dead, is there an order in which you should um, to mitigate the risk, say maybe the power supply is bad, does it make sense to first thing off the bat just pull the power connector to the logic board and test that first, or is there a certain set of best practices for ensuring you don't toast something in the process? Yeah, I would say you want to follow this approximate order. Um, anytime you pick up a new game, you should be doing an inspection before you even plug it in. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, Someone I know picked up a game and transported it to their house and plugged it right in and there it was a loose screw that uh, shorted out their power transformer and blew up the whole thing. Hey Richard. <laughs> so um, yeah, definitely you want to check and make sure that nothing, I mean, does it look like it's been burnt up? Is there something really obviously visually wrong? And you want to check that out. Uh, make sure the wiring looks good. I got a game home and someone had moved the power switch to the front of it so it was more convenient to turn off and on and they used like a lamp cord that was 30 years old and you, you know it was crumbling and the wires were just exposed and if I had plugged it in it would have caught fire so you know you definitely want to check that out first it's just going to depend on the game yeah yeah yeah, definitely you want to check the power first and isolating the other two uh, components is going to be real good. If your power supply is totally shot and your board is plugged into that, you're going to run a serious risk of blowing up your board. So I, yeah, unhook the board, unplug the monitor, check your power there, and then plug things in one by one, testing it each way as you work your way from the bottom to the top of this pyramid. Any other questions before we go to logic? Cool. So if you want to do logic testing, that means uh, fixing a circuit board itself. You're really going to want some kind of bench setup. It's really impractical to fix these boards while they're still inside the cabinet and they're not mounted for servicing. So you want to have some kind of bench rig. You can get a pretty decent setup for about 100 bucks. So you'd want to get a power supply, 20 bucks, uh, some kind of RGB monitor. Uh, you can get uh, Sony portable ones. They're really great for this for about 50 bucks. Uh, or you can use an old you know, Commodore or Amiga, any kind of RGB monitor. And then a JAMA harness for 10 or so, something like that. And then you can build adapters for your specific PCBs if you want, or you can go buy those. And that'll let you put the board right on your bench, power it up, see what it's doing, and lay it out right there so you can you know, poke at the individual components and see what they're doing. Uh, don't bother with the uh, controls at all, It's my advice. Uh, it ends up getting expensive and you don't usually need them for this. If you get some micro grabbers, some test jumpers, you can use that to get into test mode. You can use that to stimulate the I.O. Uh, I wouldn't bother with actual controls to do that. So 
Here's a centipede board. We're going to be digging into this a bit. Uh, this is a really good board for exploring because it's relatively simple, but it's very archetypical. Uh, a lot of the things you see on this board you see across all kinds of boards. And it has really good documentation. There's kind of a, a dip in your documentation. A lot of the stuff from the 70s didn't have really good docs because they were just kind of figuring stuff out. And then towards the late 70s, early 80s, they had really, really good documentation where the schematics are very detailed and they have a theory of operation and they really break down how it works and what everything is doing. And then people started using that to make uh, bootlegged clones of the games. So they quit doing that around 82. Anything post 82, you really don't have a very good schematic for. So kind of like, you know, if you want to start off with an easier board or a more documented board, something from 79 to 81 is going to be a lot easier. So here's where everything starts. This is the clock. So every board has an oscillator on it that produces a master timing signal that everything else that is on the board needs in order to run. So I'm going to give you a quick crash course on reading schematics because this is important. So everything you see on here, on the left are your inputs, and on the right and on the bottom are the outputs. So you see on the synchronizer you have uh, the uh, N1 right there is a 74 LS04. So on the bottom, SO4, that's short for 74 LS. It's a really common series of TTL logic I see. The top N1, that's the position on the board. If you look on the board, I guess you can't actually see it, but screened on the board is uh, a position number for every part. So that's physically where on the board it's located if you need to uh, check it out. So what we have here is crystal oscillator. So this vibrates at a resonant frequency and it produces a, a nice pulsing line at that specific frequency. So this is about a 12 megahertz signal. But it's not at TTL level. Uh, quick crash course on what TTL means. So the real world is an analog domain but PCBs are all digital logic. And TTL is a system for mapping analog values to digital values. So for a value of about one volt or less, that's a logic no or false. And for a value of about three volts up, that's a logic true or high. There are other systems for doing this, but all of the old boards use TTL. So you see there's this amplifier Q1. So what that's doing is that's pulling the signal up to a TTL level, and then that's inputting it into this counter at P2. So that counter is generating all of these timing signals that run the board. You'll also notice you see these, uh, like a K3, there's an LSO4. Five on the left, that's the input pin, and six on the right, that's the output pin. Sometimes you'll see the same part number in different parts of the schematic because logically how it works isn't physically how it's laid out. So you just want to make sure that the different gates, you don't get confused about it. It's the same part, just different parts of it. So there's your oscillator. I guess I should have gone through these earlier. All right, so let's talk about the counter because this is interesting. So the master clock, uh, goes into the clock input of this counter. And then you see right down here, you see various other signals coming out of it. And that, that six megahertz signal is very interesting. So this is a clock divider. And it works in the same way as binary math works. So if you have, let's say you have a reset state, your counter value is zero. One tick of the clock, it increments it to one. Next clock, increments it to two. Next clock, three and so on. And what you'll notice, boom, what you'll notice is that every time it increments, because it's binary, each bit towards the MSB is exactly one half of the rate before it. So if you give it a 12 megahertz clock, your one's position, your LSB, is always going to be 12 megahertz. And your position one up, the two's, is going to be one half that, six megahertz. And the position one up, that is 3 megahertz, and then one of that is 1.5. So all of this is generating the timing signal, and it's dividing that clock uh, in the time domain. So here's the CPU. 
in order for the CPU to run, it has to be getting this clock signal. And this is the circuit that takes those signals from the master oscillator, and these are producing your CPU master clock. So we also have to have reset signals. The CPU just doesn't just start running. You have to reset it to tell it to start running. So when you first power on a board, there is a power on reset signal. And what this does is it waits just a little bit after power is applied in order to reset the CPU and make sure that everything is ready for the game program to start running. So this is actually a very clever circuit that does this. You see there's a counter there, the LS90, and as it counts down, it will strobe that reset signal and kick off the CPU. So here's some more schematic reading. Any signal with a line over it or with a slash in front of it is an active low signal. Anything without is active high. So this just is a, an indication of whether the logic high or logic low value is what makes it trigger. So in this case, normally the, the signal will be high, and when the reset gets pulled down, it gets pulled low to ground. So every game has to have this, and some of them use different circuits. I think this is clever because it's integrated with the watchdog, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, other games will use a more standard 555 or 556 dual timer to do the same thing. But the concept is the same. It has to be reset in order for it to start working. Okay. So the watchdog. This is the source of a lot of problems and confusion. When the game is operating normally, there's a special address in memory and it accesses it uh, in a regular fashion. And what that does is it resets that reset timer. So if the program hangs or there's a bug that makes it quit working or you know, there's just anything unexpected that happens and it stops making those regular accesses, then the watchdog timer counts down and then it resets the CPU and it starts the game over. So this is really convenient for servicing the game or when you have it on location because if something goes wrong, it resets itself. And if you think about what would it be like if this didn't exist, well, the game would just get hung up and someone would have to come out there and power cycle it. You know, that's not efficient. So it's not great that it resets, but it's really going to keep that game on location from, from getting, from, you know, needing someone to come out and uh, work on it. So the watchdog itself rarely fails but a lot of times different failures will make it fail. So we're gonna talk a little bit about address buses here. Does anyone have any questions on clocks, watchdogs, any of that stuff? Cool. Okay, so Centipede uses a 6502. This is a very popular CPU for a lot of these old games. All of the Atari first party games, the games they made in-house in this era, they all used 6502s. So you've got a 16-bit address bus and an 8-bit data bus. Uh, let's talk about buses. Bus is a series of parallel wires and they are usually shared between devices. So what does that mean in practice? So the game program is running on your 6502, but in order to actually output video, it can't be handling that video workload. So there's a discrete video generator. The video generator reads into some shared RAM. So your, uh, your game program will write into video memory and then your video controller is periodically accessing that memory and outputting the video from it. So what this means is you have two different components of the board and they need to access this shared resource, your video memory. And they can't access that bus that connects the memory at the same time even though they both need access. So you have these buffers. So if you look on this, you'll see there's a, an LS244. I don't know how well you can see this. Up top, there's an LS244. That's an 8-bit unidirectional buffer at a B1. And then right below that is C1, another unidirectional buffer. So what these do is they connect and disconnect the bus from the CPU. So when the video memory needs to access the video RAM, then it's disconnected from the CPU so that those accesses don't cause any issues. 
on your data bus. Yes, question. I can try dimming the light a little bit, see if it really Yeah, go for it. I think I don't know if you can dim that light at all. No. Yeah. Yeah, that's not great, is it? Oh, there's no one for the video, or no one to adjust the projector. Okay, well, we'll plow through it and, uh, yeah. Oh. Oh. Great, okay. So we'll go back here. So right up here you have all the address lines. So th this is just a method of the CPU telling the rest of the hardware what it needs to access. And it's conceptually no different than this room. The CPU has the ability to point at any specific person and say, I need to read from you or I need to write to you. Exactly the same thing. You're using uh, a binary address, 16 bits. So 2 to the 16, 65,556, 64K address bus. Your data bus is 8 bits, and you'll see, I don't know if you can see or not, but instead of an LS244, you have an LS245. LS245, same concept, except it's bi-directional. When you're selecting an address, the CPU just has to put that address out on the bus to select it. It never reads from it. 245 is a bi-directional device, so data can go either from the bus to the CPU or the other way around. So when you make a read, the CPU puts the address from the bus, and then it reads from the data bus. And when it does a write, it puts the address on the address bus, writes out to the data bus. So everything in memory happens over these parts. If you're having memory issues of any sort, you should be looking at those because they are all common failures. So what we want to do is leverage what we have as much as possible. Most arcade PCBs from this era have a self-test mode. They'll test your RAM, they'll test your ROM. If you can get it running enough to open up self-test, then you're gonna get pretty far down the road of repair. You don't need a lot of tools. You just need a little know-how in order to get it to boot up to this point. So in order to run the self-test program, the self-test program lives in the game ROMs. So here's our game ROM setup. So we can see we have four devices, one, two, three, four. They're all connected to the same address bus, and they're all connected to the same data bus. And down here, you can see we have these different lines, ROM 0, 1, 2, 3, right? One for each chip, one for each ROM. Those turn on, I don't know if you can see it, this is CS, so that's chip select. That's a line that tells the chip, I'm ready to talk to you. And the reason we have this is because Centipede has 8K of program code. But back then you didn't have an 8K ROM, or if you did, it was too expensive. So what did they do is they split it up onto four 2K ROMs. So for the CPU to work, it needs to be visible in memory the same way. And so this is basically another address line, pretty much. So that's a thing that it uses to say what, which ROM it needs to go to. How does it know which ROM to select? Well, you have this circuit called the address decoder. So what this does is based on the value that the CPU puts out onto the address bus, it selects all of the right parts of the board. It's very intricate. I think it's really fascinating how all of this stuff kind of ties together. You know, the timing is so tight and it's just really amazing how they got all this stuff to work. So if you look at this, you'll see right up here you have a couple things. You have seen AB11, AB12. So that's the buffered address bus, address buffered. The CPU outputs are A0 through A15 for your 16-bit addresses. And then after they go through those 244s, then they are AB0 through AB15. So those go into this, which is a decoder. And you can't quite see it up here, right here, there's ROM 0, 1, 2, 3, and up at the top there's ROM. So that ROM line connects up to AB 13, so bit 13. 
And here's your uh, here's part of your address map from Centipede. Program ROM 2003 FFF R means reads only. So if you look at these addresses in binary, right, this is the value that the CPU is going to be putting out on your address bus. You'll see right here, bit 13 always turned on for that whole range. Here's the bottom, here's the top. Bit is always on. So there's your ROM indicator. And then within that range, these two bits, 11 and 12, they're some value or other, right? So if you think about that, you've got four ROMs, you've got two bits of address, two to the second, four. So each of those is addressing just those chip selects on those ROMs. So all this is great theory. In practice, nine times out of 10, it's the sockets that the ROMs go into. So if you look at these boards, for all of these ROMs, they're typically not soldered directly to the board, but they're inserted into sockets that are soldered on the board so that you can change them out. Nine times out of 10, it's just the sockets. So it's good to know how all this stuff works, but you know, check the sockets first. Is that typically due to corrosion? No, it's typically because in order for the sockets to make contact, they have to have spring and over you know, 30 some odd years, they don't have the, enough spring to make good contact. On some, you'll see corrosion on the legs of the chip. Sometimes you can pull it out, clean it off, put it back in, and it'll work. Sometimes you do that and it works for a couple days and then it fails again. Good indication that your socket is bad. Um, a lot of the sockets that ended up getting put on these boards were extremely cheap. So, you know, they were saving costs. You know, literally, you'll take them out and they'll crumble apart in your hands because they're just not very good parts and or they're extremely old. So if you replace these, you want to get good quality dual wipe sockets. What the hell does dual wipe mean? Well, the contact inside of the socket uh, wipes across one of the legs of the ROMs, right? Single wipe means there's a single contact in there making contact on one side of the parts lid. Dual wipe kind of goes in a U shape. So the leg goes in and makes contact on both sides. You get much better contact, much more reliable part. It's a few cents difference. You know, if they were producing them by the tens of thousands, it probably affected their bottom line. If you have a game in your game room and you never want to have to work on it again, go spend the 25 cents or whatever. So 3M is a good, uh, a good product for that. I put those in all mine. So does it mean desoldering the rack, the sockets from the board and putting the new sockets right through the board? Yep. Isn't that a little scary for a novice? <laughs> oh yeah, all this is scary for a novice. <laughs> and uh, the way you make it not scary is by doing it enough that you're no longer a novice. Yes. Exactly what is a ROM? That's a really great question. ROM means read-only memory. And it is a device which is programmed once and can never be changed, and it, has, it always has that value. So all of your game's uh, data and program code gets programmed onto these ROMs and put on the board, and that's the code that makes the game run. Great. So we're getting to the end of my slides, uh, but we're gonna go a little bit more and then I guess some Q&A, or I will opine without visual aid. Uh, so, Tools that you should get beyond uh, a basic uh, bench rate should definitely get a Logic Pro. This is going to be real critical, and you know there's a lot of really advanced tools that you can use, which you end up having to learn a lot about in order to use them effectively. Logic Pro is really, really simple. Costs about 20 bucks. Really great investment if you're going to be working on any of these. Uh, get one that has a beeper on it. So what they do is they usually are switchable between TTL and CMOS levels. I didn't talk about CMOS because it doesn't matter. Um, and then they have two lights on it, one indicating a logic low level and one indicating a logic high level. And by touching the probe tip to a different part, it'll tell you what the state of logic is at that specific point. Uh, when it comes with a beeper, excuse me, when it comes with a beeper, it also uh, just has a little PZO electric speaker in there and it'll make a sound. So you can tell real quick, you know, is there a signal on here or not? So basic tests you should use a logic probe for are your clock sticking. So you can't use it to test the oscillator itself because that's not TTL. 
But as soon as it hits that uh, 3, 3916, the Q1 amplifier, or as soon as it hits that LSO4 TTL, you'll be able to see and hear that clock ticking. And you can trace that all the way down. Um, you know, make sure that it's getting to your CPU. Uh, are any of your address or data lines stuck high? A lot of times what you'll see is internally inside of the chip, it fails in such a way that your line is always pulled towards your plus five, your power rail, or pulled to ground. And so the output will be fixed, it won't change. And a lot of these things are supposed to be changing over time as the program drives them. So anything you see on your address bus, anything you see on your data bus where it's just stuck at a fixed value, that's a big problem. Why is that a problem? Well, when your CPU is saying, I need to fetch this part of memory, right? And memory is the game program, not just RAM. I need to fetch this part of memory. If you have one of those bits that's not responding, it's not gonna be selecting the right address. So you're not gonna get the right data back on the data bus. You're gonna get corrupted game code, game isn't gonna run. Same deal with RAM, same deal with the data bus. Maybe it's selecting the right address, but the signal isn't getting back to the CPU. You're not getting the right instructions. Game isn't running right. What's gonna happen? Who, th who can tell me what they think is gonna happen if you have a stuck address or a stuck data line? Pop quiz. Yeah? Screen garbage? Mm, screen garbage, maybe. Frozen screen. Frozen screen, could be. What about that watchdog? You think your program is going to be... Yeah, so it's going to probably be stuck in a reset loop. So blank, blank screen? Or maybe it's flashing. Uh, floating. We didn't really talk about floating. Floating is a value that's neither high nor low, right? So maybe... There's no voltage at all. That's a floating output. On those buffer chips, that's a feature, right? When you say disconnect, that means that doesn't get through. So that's high impedance, high Z is what they call it. Uh, so that's a feature of that. But if it's on a regular TTL chip, that's not what you want. So uh, you want to be looking up your data sheets. What's a data sheet? Glad you asked. Data sheet is a document that describes how a specific device works. So let's say I mentioned an LSO4. Who knows what an LSO4 is? Yeah, one person. So how do you find out? Well, 74 LSO4 data sheet. It'll tell you exactly what it is, exactly how it works, exactly which pins are inputs, exactly what pins are outputs, which things should be doing what when. So using those data sheets to figure out how is this supposed to work? Hugely important. Okay, beyond the basics. Let's say you want to really build out a bench. I would say an oscilloscope is easily the very first thing you should be getting beyond a logic probe and a bench. What's an oscilloscope? Glad you asked. An oscilloscope is a device that allows you to plot voltage over time. What does that mean in practice? It means you can look at a signal, not just in a binary high or low, but you can plot an analog voltage, or you can see exactly what's happening. Where is this useful? Let's say you have a board and it's outputting scrambled video. Looks like it's not syncing. And you adjust your sync on your monitor, still nothing. But you know the monitor is good. Board just isn't outputting good sync. So maybe I'll digress into video sync. You have two basic kinds, positive and negative, and discrete and composite. So your, monitor, your board, in order to output analog video, has to tell the monitor, I'm at the end of this line, I'm ready for a new line, and I'm at the end of the entire screen, go back to the very top and re start rescanning. So those are two different signals. They're usually multiplexed on the same wire. So if you have an oscilloscope, you can look at that sync and say, oh, I see there's the horizontal sync, but it's missing the vertical. Or the other way around. Can't do that with the logic probe. Uh, an in-circuit emulator. These are great. I have a bunch of them. What these let you do is they, you pull the CPU out of the board and you put the circuit emulator into the same socket. And this allows you to take over the entire board and do whatever you want with it. So you can test the RAM, test the ROM. It'll tell you, you know, I don't have power. My address bus isn't working. I don't have a clock. You, all of these things, it'll just tell you. And you can write your own programs that run on the board to exercise different parts of it to debug it. Really great tool. Pretty spendy, wouldn't recommend it unless you're doing a lot of repairs. 
logic analyzer. This is like a logic probe except multi-channel, essentially. You hook it up to different test points on your board and you say run and you run the board and it shows you these are all of the logic levels over time for all of these signals. Really cool tool. And an IC tester or comparator. There are a couple of these cheapo ones on eBay for 50 bucks or so. They're pretty good. They're good for 50 bucks. What does this let you do? Well, you can take an IC out of your board. You, let's say you think that LSO4 that combines my sync signals, I think that's broken because I only see horizontal sync coming out. I don't see vertical, but I see them both going in. Well, there's your theory. So you pull that out and you stick it in your tester and your tester says, it's not working. Hey, your theory was great. Replace the chip, board's fixed. Or it says, nope, it's working fine. Well, practice makes perfect. Go put in a socket, put it back in, keep debugging. Okay, so here's the end of my slides. I had some other stuff I wanted to cover. Um, here's another problem I see a lot of, which is game plugs in, outputs the video, but it just gives you a screen full of garbage. It doesn't change at all. Who has an idea what that might be? Where would you start investigating that? The clock. Clock. So, good call. But the clock drives the video too, right? That master oscillator it gets divided out. That stuff drives all the video output. So if you have any kind of stable video output, you have at least some clocks. It might be the clock right at that CPU. But I would say the power on reset. That's what you should be looking at. Is that on the board? On the board. Yeah. So what will happen is when the board boots up at first, it will start outputting video, right? Remember they have shared video memory. When you power on RAM, it just has garbage in there. Who knows? So your video circuit is just going to be outputting whatever happens to be in there. When your actual program starts running, one of the very first things it does is it zeroes out video memory. Makes it a blank screen. Normally it happens so fast you don't even see it. Boots up. Static, unchanging, good sign that your program isn't running. If you have a board and you want to see this, pull the CPU out. No CPU to run the program. Everything's going to be running right. You'll just get a static screen full of garbage. Good candidate for a power on reset or a bad CPU. Sometimes even a CPU goes bad. Who has questions? Who has a symptom? I've, I've got a Rampage World Tour that after five or ten minutes of play will reset and go to garbage. Yeah. Sounds heat related. Too much voltage? Could that be heat? Related? Have you checked it? It looks like 12 plus a little, a little less a little. Yeah, I don't. That's, it sounds like a heat related failure. What'll happen is all electronics, you know, any electric device generates a small amount of waste heat. I've tried four different, um, four different power supplies. Right, because it's probably a, a problem on your board. Right, so you'll have a device that's right on the edge of failure. And as it warms up, everything expands, everything changes, and it'll start failing just because it got hotter. So you can get if you get a heat gun with a narrow nozzle, turn it on and just start going over your different components. Or you can use uh, just freeze spray. freeze spray, exactly. Yep. Freeze the board. Freeze each component. Exactly. Find a component you suspect, hit it with freeze spray, see if it starts working again. Um, I know some people use thermal imaging. So if there's a part of the board that's getting hotter than the rest, that can be a sign of failure. You can also just stick your thumb on it and see if your fingerprint melts off. <laughs> yep. Another issue with that could be a bad edge connector. Yeah, bad edge connector. This is, I should have stressed this more, but the physical connections are really critical. And it's important not to get too stuck in the logic. And a lot of problems, you just look at the board and you'll see there's your issue. It, it actually did start after I pulled the board out to try another JAMA board and then put it back in. And I kind of thought, well, maybe that original board had been in the cabinet for a long time and there was a connector issue. What do you do? Place the connector. Try, try the board in another cabinet, right? Clean it first. 
clean the connector. And what's the best way to clean those internal connector contacts? Uh, if you get deoxid, if they're oxidized, then it'll strip some of that off. So what I do is I get a piece of cardboard, soak that in deoxid, and then uh, put it in there, insert, remove, and I'll scrub off most of the stuff. But this is another one of those cases where, you know, that might be a quick fix, but probably replacing the connector is in order. Uh, but again, you can bisect your problem. So you think maybe it's the connector, take the board, put it in another machine, put it on a test rig, see does the symptom follow? Does it happen if you put a different board into that cabinet and let it run for a while? Right? See where that symptom goes. Yes? I never explained what a RAM was. A RAM is random access memory. So that is temporary storage inside of the game. And this is used for keeping track of the state of the machine. So number of players left, score, position on screen of whatever your characters are. And again, for the video RAM, that's going to say at this point on the screen, what thing am I displaying? The opposite of wrong. The opposite of wrong. It's almost. I have one question up here. Um, what's a CPU? What's a CPU? Another good question. CPU is the central processing unit, and it is a device that executes the program. Before there were games with CPUs, there were games that were built entirely out of discrete logic. So Pong, built out of discrete logic, Breakout, uh, Computer Space, all of these have no CPU at all. They're just built out of logic. And they can be a lot harder to troubleshoot because you can't use tools like an in-circuit emulator. There isn't one because there's no circuit to emulate. Right? There's, it's just all TTL. Uh, they tend to have some pretty cool schematics and it's really interesting because the way the game works is the exact same way as it is in hardware. So you can look at it and you can see, you know, here's, here's the signal that says, exactly what should be happening at any time and it's sort of a visibility into how the game works that you don't get on CPU based games. Yes? So I have a game where I'm getting distortion through the top and bottom of the monitor just like a wave through the picture. Mm -hmm. um, any idea what might be... You haven't talked about monitors. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I would have time for it. Um, wave through there. So it's hard to say. You get kind of a feel for where the problem is after seeing a lot of these. And problems on the board tend to be digital, right? So you'll see there's a line through the character, or a color is missing, or you know some uh, very discrete unit that you can point to and say, that, that should be there, and it's not. And things like waves tend to be more analog. And so I would suspect the monitor on that. But I would bisect it. I would hook up the monitor to, monitor to a known good video source. Or I would replace the PCB with one that you know is working right. And I'd see, where does that problem go? I have one over here. All right. I work with uh, a lot of like Konami dance machines. And most of my friends do too. How much of this applies to stuff from you know, the turn of the century? <laughs> Oh, I would say the basic concepts are the same, but those are a lot harder to repair. You know, post 86 or so, a lot of these started getting made with surface mount technology, which is much, much harder to repair. Um, I know there are people out there that do it, but just the level of equipment you need and they also started making a lot of custom parts for these boards, so you can't source those the way you can your basic TTL stuff. Definitely it applies. You know, bisection applies to any kind of problem, not even just electronics, not even just games. So you can definitely use that. But as far as circuit level stuff, um, I think it's broadly applicable, but the details are going to be a lot different. Like you still have stuff like a clock and watchdog and yeah, a lot of those games are based off of, you know, PC style motherboards. So, you know, there's a lot of different stuff post, you know, in the 90s, they started making CPUs that have internal clocks. So you don't have an external <coughs> clock circuit to drive it. Okay. And you don't have the same sort of discrete video hardware. You know, you'll have 
something that looks more like a video card like you would have on a PC. Like Hydro Thunder uses uh, you know, an AGP video card and a PC style motherboard. So they really started making less custom hardware yeah. and more integrated hardware around there. Um, so unfortunately, I think that might be a lost era of games. You know, it's, those are going to be a lot harder to keep running because people aren't going to keep making that stuff. Oh my gosh, so many questions. I haven't answered any from you in the blue shirt. Me? Yeah. Uh, so I have a question about the video card, the, the monitor. I uh, replaced the flyback transformer, but mm -hmm. the main transistor on it blows every time I can turn it on. So you, you replaced the flyback, but what's blowing? The, it's, it's a power transistor. The horizontal. Oh, the voltage regulator? Yeah. Uh, it's, I don't know, I'm not sure. It's, it's been like side. several years since I've looked at this thing. It's the side of the chest. What kind of monitor is it? Uh, it's, it's a K, it's a 17, K17, I think. Okay. Um, so that's a good candidate for recap or uh, bridge rectifier. So a lot of those you'll see uh, you have your power supply, you have, you know, 115 volt AC input, um, and then you have some, you know, regulation and then filtering. So I, something downstream from there is probably shorted. Or, you know, I've seen some people do this. If it's the bottle cap style of transistor, uh, they just won't insulate it correctly, or they'll use conductive thermal grease instead of non-conductive thermal grease. Um, so you might check that. Uh, but again, you know, you can, you can bisect this. So let's take your voltage regulator and disconnect the output, right? Does it still blow? That'll let you know, is it something downstream? Is it your rectifier that's feeding into your regulator? Or is it something upstream that's shorting? Um, there's also uh, a series of flow charts for monitor repair. If you Google you know, the uh, name of the monitor flow chart, then it'll give you a pretty good idea. A lot of them are specific to a single monitor, but also the concepts are broadly applicable. So you can say, this is what I'm seeing, and so that's what I think this problem might be. Um, and then there's also, if you go on Clov, KLOV, uh, there's a lot of people there who have repaired really weird and obscure monitors. Anything, you know, Wells Gardner or Electro Home is going to be pretty well documented. So there will be a lot of people that can give you specifics based on what you're seeing. Yes? One comment, one question. To me, TTL means totally. They what? Mean to totally different thing. It means uh, type four. Got it. And uh, my question: uh, What's a motherboard? What's a motherboard? A motherboard is the main printed circuit board that contains the logic for a system. So many boards, many games will have a multi-board setup, and you'll see a motherboard that runs the main program and a daughter board that handles the sound, or on some of the Atari vector games, you have a daughter board that handles the 3D math. So Tempest, Battlezone, Red Baron, they all have a huge <laughs> dedicated hardware board, and all it does is the 3D math to make those games run. Really hard to fix those. Yes? Do you ever have problems where you have to take the PCB and do, like, put it up into, like, reflow solder points or anything like that? No. T typically, the, the things that require reflow are typically higher voltage or higher physical stress. There isn't too much uh, that happens like that on a PCB. You're much more likely to find a uh, broken connection because the operator you got it from put in a, a teetering stack of 50 boards and one scraped a trace off on the way down. Um, typically, you don't have to do a lot of reflow. The only other case where I've found that necessary is repairing other people's bad repairs. This is, I would say, almost more than anything else, this is the source of trouble, is bad repairs from other people. I've gotten a lot of stuff where they just had no idea. And, you know, I've had to rebuild entire memory address buses because they had one bad RAM. They were like, well, I'll just replace them all. And then they just destroyed all the pads getting them out. Well, okay. So pick it up for 20 bucks and rebuild it all and get a working board. Yes. 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 Um, I have two questions. 
Okay. What is a sister board and what is TTU? Well, I think that in the board family, you generally only have mothers and daughters. And a TGU, I'm not sure what that is. TTL is transistor to transistor logic. Yeah? Um, I have a monitor that was shocked, and the bottom left portion quadrant of the monitor now is kind of purplish. The colors are off. Mm -hmm. What, what do you mean shocked? Uh, took a tumble. Oh. Put it that way. So, right. I'm assuming, I'm assuming stuff on, something on the yoke is messed up. I can't see any loose things, and I don't think it's the shadow mask inside. Because mm -hmm. the rest of the game, if the game plays fine, monitors. Yeah. So, what you're describing is a purity problem. So, on a monitor, you have three electron guns, one for red, one for green, one for blue. And on the front, on the face of the tube, you have a shadow mask. And what that is, is a series of triads of red, green, and blue. And the monitor, as it deflects the beam, it deflects it so that the red gun only hits red, green only hits green, and so on. And when you have an error in the direction of that beam, then your red gun might strike a green phosphor. It's called a purity problem. So to fix something like that, there, this is described in great detail in the manual for your monitor, at least if you have one that has a reasonable set of documentation. It's eminently fixable. It is uh, kind of a hassle. But the, the procedure is documented in there. I would say, if you look at the back of the monitor, so you have your CRT, your tube. I'm assuming this is not an LCD. <laughs> you have a CRT. and uh, on the neck of the CRT, you have what's called a yoke. And the yoke is a set of electromagnetic coils. And your monitor chassis drives current through those, and that attracts the beam of the monitor in one direction or another. And so that's what makes it scan top to bottom, right to left on a raster monitor. So after the yoke on the neck, you have a set of uh, convergence and purity rings. And these are Mag rings that have magnets inset, and they control the convergence in the center of the screen and the overall purity. And the two at the very front are your purity adjustments. Closest to the closest tube. to the face of the tube. Oh, closest to the face of the tube. Yes. If you if you think of it as face of the tube, connector of the tube, end of the neck, they're oh. closest to the face. Those are your purity adjustments. So if you put a red, green, blue signal into there and you adjust those, you can probably adjust it out. It might be that your yoke moved around. Uh, that can also be fixed, but as a hassle. I'd also just try degaussing it. You know, I would start there. Yes. What's a what? CVP? You mean a CRT? A CRT is a cathode ray tube, vacuum tube display used in all of these old games. Yep. What is an error? An error is a problem or something that's wrong. Yeah? I got a Mortal Kombat 1 board and a board that I got with no low punch on the right hand player. And I can't see any broken solder traces, though I'm assuming that's what it is. I can't trace it back from the very edge of the, the edge connector. Yeah, this is a great uh, place to use a logic probe. So on these kind of boards, all of your inputs have some kind of protection against them, just to make sure that if you know something shorts out or something hits your button or whatever, it's not gonna totally blow that part of your PCB. So unfortunately, that's a board that doesn't have a very good schematic. Is it, is it fixable, you think? Or just oh, anything's fixable. You can fix anything. So how hard is it to fix? So typically, you'll see there's a resistor network on the edge. On old games, you'd see just a whole bunch of resistors put there in series. On newer games, you'll see a resistor pack. So what you want to do is use your meter in continuity mode and find that pin where that button connects and trace it back. So you'll probably see it goes to a resistor. In some cases, it'll go to a low value capacitor. And it's very possible that that part is open. So look on one side 
and make sure that your button is working, right? So you should be able to put your logic probe on exactly that with it powered up and push the button and hear it go beep beep, right? As it goes from high level to low level when you push the button, then just keep moving down your circuit. So other side of the resistor, same thing. If you don't hear it, your resistor is probably open. Yes. I have, what's a resistor? Okay, I'll answer yours then yours. A uh, resistor is a device that restricts the flow of current from one point to another. Yeah, I'm going to answer yours first. Uh, they can ask me these questions at home. Uh, I have a Ms. Pac-Man machine that sometimes when you turn it on it's darker than normal and certain characters might be missing or different colors. Normally, if I leave it for a while, I'll turn it off, turn it back on, I might be able to get it to work normally, and then it seems to work fine for a while, and then maybe half an hour in, it'll just start throwing random characters up, and I hear a clicking, which I'm guessing is the watchdog, mm. or the coin thing. Yeah, the coin counter. I'm, I'm guessing that's the watchdog resetting machine, or? That, so this is actually really fascinating, and I love this particular failure in game machines. What's actually happening is that coin counter is mapped into your memory, just like anything else on the device. And the CPU writes out a value to somewhere in memory, and that's connected to hardware that makes that counter advance. So what's happening is your game program isn't running correctly, and it's trying to write some value. Maybe it's trying to write a value into RAM, and it's getting corrupted, and it's just writing spraying writes all over memory. And some of those are hitting your coin counter and making it click. Okay. So this is a really common failure problem when you have bad ROM socket. I would say uh, on, that would be a good thing to check out. Definitely you have PCB issues. You might also have monitor issues. So what are we going to do? Going to hook up a known good signal to that monitor and see does that problem happen there as well. That will let you know do I have a problem with one or both or the other. Yes. I was playing Wizard War, two players on Fifth Dungeon on Anthony's machine over there. Suddenly, the monsters were freezing, but then they were moving around, but their frozen shadows would stay there, and it was just garbage. What is that? What is that? So, that's a very interesting set of hardware, and in order to move those sprites around, it's actually writing out the name. You, you'll notice as two of the monsters go over top of each other, the part where the intersect turns off, right? That's an artifact of how it's written. It's XORing the value of the sprite into video RAM in order to move the monitor, or move the monster. So it sounds like part of the video circuitry or the circuitry to address the video RAM isn't working. So the CPU has said, move the position here by writing these values out. They're not getting written out, and so they're still in there, they're in memory, the video circuit is picking it up, and they're moving all around the maze in the game's internal state, but you're still seeing that remnant of them on the display. Is it fixable? I mean, it was, the game was... Anything's fixable. Couldn't play it. There's yeah. the, was the, the kind of neat thing and the kind of pain in the butt thing about this is that this board is a stack of like seven different PCBs in a cage. So here's a great uh, application of bisecting. You take a working board set, one at a time, you swap the boards out. Where does the problem go? Right? Then you say, now the problem's on this board. And then you throw it in a pile and you never fix it because it's like you can't probe down there because it's in the middle of a bunch of piles of boards. Okay, I have one more question. I'm going to let you ask me questions at home if you have them. Does anyone else have one more question? Yes. So, like jumping back on the ramp, like back then the ramp so what if you replaced a 2K RAM with a 20K RAM? Well, the game is still only going to be able to address 2K of it, and anything that it has more storage than that is not going to be pin compatible. So if you wanted to do that just to eliminate that circuitry, because it is a lot of circuitry, the address decoding and all that stuff, what you could do is, uh, like they make high score save kits for some of these games. And there is, it's a little satellite board, so you pull the CPU out and you put the board in and you put the CPU in there, and it'll save all your scores across power cycles. Really cool feature. You can do the same thing with RAM. So you say, don't even bother connecting all the address or data pins or whatever, you know, put a RAM on there, 
and just redirect everything uh, on that board into there. But as far as you know, swapping out a part that's substantially different, that's just not going to work. You could make an adapter, but you'd still only be able to address 2K of it. You wouldn't like you can't create more RAM for the game. So yeah. I was saying about that, like Williams game, you know, there's 24 RAM chips and one of them dies and it kills your whole game. Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about replacing 24 of them, you could do something like that. It would be a real weird setup, right? Because you'd have to, every, every one, so you have your shared address bus and your shared data bus. Those are available on every one of those components. But the chip select lines are only available on each one. So you'd have to fabricate a huge board that just you press in place over all of the sockets and then you have one on it. So I think it would be cost prohibitive to do that. Cool. Yes. So are there any parts or any components that you're seeing, you know, the industry running out of or, you know, is there not being manufactured anymore? In your mind, what would you hoard that's going to be super rare? Everything! <laughs> yeah, but there's a space limitation, right? And, and not, not hoarding for, you know, reselling, but just because yes. it's not going to be there anymore. Yeah, any of the customs, uh, I would, those are the first to go. All of the stuff made by Namco used uh, a lot of customs, pole position, Galaga, Xevious, Dig Dug, Pac-Man, uh, all of these used chips that were fabricated by Namco specifically for those games, only made by Namco, can't get them anywhere. If they fail, can't do much about it. As far as real common stuff, 2114 RAMs are on tons and tons of games that fail really often, and those supplies are drying up. No one is making them. So I bought a hundred of them a while back and I got a pretty good price on it, but they're like 250 a pop. If you do a lot of repairs, that adds up. So try and buy in bulk and sit on those. Um, I would say 2716 EPROMs, also uh, getting harder to find. Pokey, that's an Atari custom chip used in a lot of IO and sound, also real hard to find. I just bought a uh, stock of new old stock parts uh, for those which will keep me going for a while. So it's going to depend a lot on the board and what you want to work on. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. And I just want to leave you with the uh, thought you can fix anything. Uh, this stuff is really not as hard as it seems. Go read some schematics. Go try some stuff. Go break some stuff. And uh, you know, good luck.